Good afternoon and uh, welcome back. Uh, <clears throat> for the second lecture, which is be, be, will be delivered by Professor Don Frankel in the ICTS Infosys Chandrasekhar Lecture Series. Uh, <clears throat> today, is the, she, he's going to talk about, uh, uh, from it's there already, uh, from self-assembly to self-recognition. Uh, and uh, this will be for like 55 minutes, and then we'll have some time for uh, questions and discussions. So, uh, Professor Frankel. Uh, th thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to give my, my second talk. Uh, yesterday I said that I was giving not research talks, but really talks that are more introductory in nature. As the meeting develops, you'll find that some of my talks are not introductory, but are post-introductory, if that's a possible word. Because uh, after Ben Rogers' talk, you'll find that quite a few of the things that I have to say in the early part of my talk uh, have already been covered in, in, in much more detail than I'll do. Uh, so you're well prepared. Maybe we can turn the light a bit lower. Um, anyway, so uh, I hope that during my talk, the meaning of all these symbols, and they, they all have to do something with self-assembly, will become clear. This symbol is not self-assembled, but I will not comment on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say at the beginning of the talk is that um, in a talk you can say many things. Very often you say too many things. And uh, I think it's important uh, that at the end of the talk, uh, one, maybe two messages will stick. And to explain that, I show this picture from Cambridge. This is a, a rather famous pub in Cambridge, the Anchor. And one of the reasons why the pub is famous is that this is the place where in 1953, Watson and Crick announced uh, that they had discovered the, st the structure of DNA. And there's actually a plaque on the outside of the wall of the, uh, of the anchor saying that uh, this is where, where they, they announced the structure. Uh, they think, and, 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 and of course the anchor is very proud of this fact, so much so that they have introduced a special beer the eagle, so it's, so it's not the anchor, it's the eagle. I, I may tell them it's the eagle, eagle DNA beer. And here you see it. And so uh, I mean, it's clear that, that this, this, this presentation, informal presentation by Watson and Crick, made a huge impact, except that they weren't listening. And you can see that because this DNA is left handed. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so that's what I mean by if one message sticks is okay, sometimes zero message sticks, but okay, good. Uh, I'll be talking about different aspects of self-assembly and uh, the, the, the number of people have been involved in this work. Actually, if I would list everybody, it would be more, but these are the key people involved and at some point I probably will mention some of their work more explicitly. Um, as I talk about self-assembly, I can heavily borrow on what Ben Rogers was saying, and it is, as it was saying before, I borrow from what he was saying before. Uh, I'll just basically uh, try to, to explain what in my view is, is the reason why, why people are so interesting, and, and I'll come pretty much to the same conclusion that Ben had, namely that uh, it allows you to have, to have building blocks that that have been programmed, that actually have a structure such that they spontaneously assemble into target structures. It will take a while before they form an Apple computer, but uh, in principle, this is the, the idea that you, you just put everything in a pot in a container, you shake it, and out comes some kind of target structure. In practice, practice they will be nanoscale structure or make me micron scale structures that do something interesting. Now, what are the, the interesting things that people are talking about when they look at self-assembly? Uh, over the past decades, there has been a, a, a very large amount of work on self-assembling stru uh, structures that people used to study because of their interesting physical properties. Uh, lots of work on materials that have possible interesting optical properties like photonic band cap materials there can be interesting electronic magnetic properties etc but and and they typically are bulk properties of the whole material or possibly surface properties of the whole material now the second category and this is closer to uh 
Ben Rogers' uh, uh, self-assembling Mac, uh, is that you try to make things that do logical operations. And, and logical operations doesn't mean electronics to me. It just means uh, that you have different inputs and different outputs, which, by the way, is the, is the most common example uh, of existing uh, uh, nanoscale devices that self-assemble. Now, here I mentioned the bulk properties, the photonic bulk properties. Typically what you need there uh, is a, a structure that may be complex. Marion Deitz, I men mentioned the, the lavas phase before. That's the structure where people uh, have high hopes that it might have uh, photonic band cap uh, features that are attractive. Complex structures, few building blocks. In contrast, if you want to make nanoscale logical devices, you don't care about the, the structure. The structure could be very simple. It could be a simple cubic lattice or something like that. But it needs very many different building blocks. And then you can see that, in, again, if we go back to a computer, but let's not assemble an entire computer, but just to try to assemble a memory chip. If you want to form a memory chip by self-assembly, you would need to have all the components of a memory chip. That means the wires, so you need gold colloids, you need silicon colloids, P-silicon, P-dope silicon, maybe N-dope silicon, silicon dioxide. All these things would have to arrange in such a way that after they found their place, they could be sintered to form the device that you want. It, I mean, A, it, it is not there, it probably will never be there, and if it would be there, it wouldn't work because it would just burn out instantly, but that's not the point. The point is basically that you need many different building blocks to get a, a, a complex structure that can do logic. And uh, let's exam look at existing examples, and the existing examples of the materials uh, are all in biology. Uh, Typically, they are protein complexes. Again, Ben had a very nice picture of protein complexes that do essential functions. And these things, to me, are computers because they have inputs and they have outputs. And very often the input is chemical and the output is chemical, but that doesn't matter. Uh, protein RNA complexes, the ribosome, it all has many different building blocks that have to come together in a very precise way to form the structure you want. There are also man-made structures that have many different building blocks, and I'll come back to that later in my talk, uh, in, in, the, in, in particular so-called DNA brick structures. But the, the one example that you probably have seen, although it, it is a bit different in nature, but it is a complex structure that you can form for microscopic building blocks uh, that have been programmed to arrange in a certain way, is DNA origami, about which I will say very little, but not totally zero. Okay, so this is the, the kind of things that that I will be mainly talking about um, because the, this structural complexity that you uh, that you can achieve uh, by uh, arranging things in space uh, is something that that I briefly hinted at yesterday, uh, but Marjolein Dijkstra discussed it this morning in much more detail. Uh, so it was in lecture one, and basically you can understand much of the, the features of these systems through packing and the rest, maybe through electrostatics or possibly by selective DNA interactions. But uh, this is the way you get structural complexity. You get this kind of addressable complexity where really you say one unit has to go here, the other unit has to go there, the other unit has to go there. It requires specific interaction because every particle has to know uh, which one, which other particles are supposed to be its neighbor. So you need a specific interaction in such a way that particles can recognize their neighbors and assemble to, to form the, the, the target structure. So this uh, is, is very difficult to achieve by anything else than specific interactions. And if you then look at uh, how this is done, and now I can basically very quickly go over the ground that, that Ben just copied. Uh, you, 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 the, the, the obvious thing to do is you want to make use of molecules that recognize each other. Now, in principle, there are many such molecules. Proteins can recognize other proteins very well, so there's, there's a lots of specific interactions in nature, in biology, that in principle do this. We, or I mean, I shouldn't say we, this is a kind of royal we that means everybody else but me, but Ben Rogers and his student, they use DNA. Why? Because A, DNA can be synthesized to order, so if you want it, you just 
sort of type in the sequence on a website, you get out your credit card and you have it in a few days in the lab. So there's a, there's a, a, a short uh, innovation cycle with DNA. And secondly, we know the interactions very well. So if you know the DNA sequence, like you have, for instance, a, a, an 8 or 12 nucleotide sequence that has to bind to another sequence. If you know the sequence, you know the salt concentration, you know the temperature, you know the pH, you type it in, and it gives the binding free energy in kilocalories per mole. And the only thing that I would have to do is then to convert kilocalories per mole into units that I understand. But that for other people, that doesn't seem to be a problem. So DNA is a wonderful building block uh, to, to, to actually get these particles here to interact. And here, I, I was a lot lazier than Ben, who put lots and lots of DNA on his colloid. I, I gave up after a dozen or so. But, but this is typically what you use, complementary DNAs that could be binding together. Now, the, uh, the field of DNA-coated colloid, and, and actually the very idea that this would allow you to make complex structures, uh, originated more than 20 years ago uh, with experiments that were published simultaneously by uh, Chet Merkin and, and a group of uh, Alifizatos in Nature. And I'll, I'll discuss the Chet Merkin uh, experiments to explain something that actually was a question that uh, Prabal asked earlier uh, when Ben was talking, uh, namely, what determines the sharpness of the transition? So here you see a, a, the experiment that Chad Mergen did, where you have, in this case, nanocolloids, gold, uh, gold particles coated with single cell DNA. In this case, the DNA doesn't really bind to the DNA on the other particles, so the, the, the yellow and the blue don't bind directly. They only bind if there's a complementary DNA sequence, single cell DNA sequence in solution, uh, but that actually doesn't really change the physics of the problem. And so, at high temperature, nothing happens. The particles just whiz around in solution, brownie in motion. You cool it down, and at some point, you get a transition where they stick together. And because these are gold colloids, as they stick together, they get closer together, and you get a shift in the plasmon resonance frequency. And you see, you can do de detect this phenomenon uh, <coughs> uh, spectroscopically. And so then, you, this is a way to detect <coughs> let's see, that, that you have this specific uh, d a gene fragment in solution. So this is a gene detector. And now let's look at, at, at how this works. But before I, s I continue, you should realize that typically that's not the way people detect gene fragments. So you, you've all heard about DNA arrays where people have well plates with thousands of wells with different single strand DNA. And the way that works is that you have here a well, this is a different piece of single cell DNA. If the, a complementary strand single cell DNA comes, is in solution, it would, for instance, bind to this well. Then there's a fluorescent molecule that only fluoresces if there's double strand DNA. So if this lights up, you know that you had this strand of solution. And of course, this is wonderful because this is massively parallel. So rather than detecting one piece of DNA, one the gene fragment, you detect hundreds of thousands. So this is the standard technology. So why would anybody use the, the DNA-coated colloids? Well, precisely because of the sharpness of the transition. And so here you see what would happen in the same case. These are both experiments. If you have uh, colloids, uh, DNA-coated colloids that are binding by gene fragments, at low temperature, everything is bound in both cases. At high temperature, nothing is bound. So this is actually the, the spectroscopic measurements. But let's say that's a measure for how much is bound. As you heat up the, the single cell DNA, indeed there's about a 30 degree range from having 90% bound to having 10% bound. Here, it is indeed, in this particular case, it's a few degrees. For the larger colloids that Ben was mentioning, it's only one degree. A very, very sharp transition. So this is what we'd like to understand. Okay, this is the only theory I'll do today. Um, and the theory, here you see one colloid with one piece of DNA, and another colloid with a complementary piece of DNA. And depending on the temperature, at very high temperature, these pieces of DNA are just moving around. As you cool it down, they are more likely to bind, so they bind occasionally and they, they open again. At very low temperatures, they're always bound. And so what you simply do is you define, you say, at high temperatures, this probability to be bound is low, and the probability to be unbound is, is high, and that changes as you change the temperature. And I use this ratio just to define free energy. Not, I mean, the free energy is nothing else, more or less, than just minus kT times the log of this ratio. So we have a free energy, and the free energy 
of binding tells us what's going to happen. If the free energy is very large and negative, you can see this is going to be a huge number, so the bound wins. And conversely, if it's very small, the unbound wins. But this is not very realistic, as you will realize, because typically we work with colloids that contain many DNA. Now, the, the first thing that I want to say before I do that is uh, that the other thing that's important is that if the colloids are too far apart, nothing binds. So at large distances, nothing binds. And so the, this free energy binding actually depends on where you are. Uh, but that's not, not particularly important. What is more important is what happens as you put more DNAs. Now, DNAs that are, for instance, here cannot bind to DNA there. So there's a certain number of DNAs that are within each other's range. And I don't quantify how you calculate that, but you can make very good estimates of how, what that number is. But I use it at the moment just to make a very simple order of magnitude estimate of what's going to happen if you have not one particle binding, but many. Because suppose that every DNA can bind to only one DNA on the other side. Now, that is a simplification, but it, it makes life easier. So then uh, this bond can be on or it can be off. This one can be on or it can be off. And the point is, and this Ben mentioned this in passing already, uh, the two colloids are only unbound if every single one of these pairs is unbound. Now, if we assume that these bonds are all independent, the probability that all pairs are unbound is simply the probability that the single pair is unbound to the power n. And this thing is now suddenly very strongly temperature dependent. And that explains that this is the multivalency effect that makes the thing very sharp. So uh, you get something that this thing depends very strongly on temperature, very strongly on delta F, and very strongly on the number of DNAs between the two colloids. And it doesn't have to be DNAs. At the end of my talk, I'll talk about some very different things. Actually, if, if, you, if you like mathematics, you can work out that for large N and small delta F, it depends doubly exponentially on the binding free energy. So this is really, really a strong dependence. Good. Um, does this simple model work? Well, if you, this is a kind of Mickey Mouse model to describe what would happen if you have only a single DNA binding to a single thing, on this, like in the, in the DNA, the DNA array. So it's a single DNA binding, and then you get here the, the 20 degree or 30 degrees transition, and you rough, roughly reproduce that the same shape for uh, in the model with only one thing binding. And here you see what happens if you have, in this case, only seven binding. And you see that immediately two things happen. The transition shifts to higher temperature, and it becomes much sharper. Now, I haven't explained yet why people want to use DNA coated colors to detect gene fragments. One of the important applications, if you want to detect a gene from a, a gene that has a single nucleotide mutation, the red and the black curves indicate two DNA strands that, that differ in a single nucleotide. You see here that the difference in the, the percentage bound for the single DNA detection, it is, it is there, but it's not very large. In, in contrast, if you go to the multivalent thing with the DNA quality, you get a very large difference. So this is a very good way to detect small differences in DNA. So this is one of the areas where, where people have been using this. Uh, but of course, the physics community was mainly interested in using this to make materials. And so uh, Ben shows all that certainly the groups of Chad Merkin, Ole Gang, all these people have been making wonderful, mainly nano-based, there's nano-colloid-based nano DNA materials that formed ordered structures. And Ben showed a number of, of uh, larger colloid based structures uh, and, and actually there's a number of groups who have been doing similar things and as we have a lot of uh, knowledge this is an example of a simulation I will not go into the details but the thing is until now the number of distinct components so if you want to make a device I said you need dozens or, or maybe hundreds of different components the number of distinct components in these structures until now is quite small I mean it, it, it certainly two or three is feasible. If you go beyond that, you need, you need really special skills, skills and special tricks. And I, I'm not aware of an example where people have done more than, than four or five. And even that, those examples are, are mainly what, what I, I heard indirectly. So it is extremely difficult to go beyond large and beyond a, a small number of distinct building blocks. And the, so this is an important question. Why is it that in, 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 although we can design structures where we say, oh, we, this particle should go here, this particle should go there, we know exactly where it should go. We can actually compute how stable the structure should be. We know that it's sta that structure is more stable than any other structure 
and still it doesn't form. That's of course very depressing, and the reason why it doesn't form is, is actually the very same reason why these DNA corticologists are good gene detectors. They have this very sharp response. And the thing is that if you have a very sharp response, it is really difficult, although actually Ben is one of the people, the person who has worked on it most, very difficult to tune the interactions in such a way that they all bind in the same temperature regime. So what happens typically is that two colloids that bind at a bit higher temperature come to together and they, they start to, to stick together. And then you cool down so that the next one can bind. By that time, the first pair is so tightly bound because it's very sharp that it cannot move anymore. And so these structures cannot anneal. And as you know, if, if you do anything with crystal growth, is annealing is absolutely essential to get good quality crystals. And you could, you ask yourself, probably. <laughs> Sorry, you, you have to use the microphone, I'm afraid. DNA contour length fluctuation is rather large. Like if I have two colloids yeah. uh, connected by a DNA length of 65 or 100 uh, base pairs, yeah. the fluctuation of the length of the distance between them, that's quite uh, no, significant. It, I mean, actually, it, it, it depends a bit on how you do it. But I mean, some people have used uh, flexible spaces and then a, a, a sticky end. And there's others that, that, that have used rigid things. On the whole, for the flexible ones, yes, you have fluctuations, but, but basically you can approximate this as Gaussian cause, and, and the, there's no, that is, doesn't create any special complication. I see. Okay. Is it that the multi number of more links present that uh, freeze that uh, fluctuation also? Is that the valency comes into picture? Well, I mean, it, as soon as the, the, the DNA length is such that you can reach several other targets on the surface, then you get a very interesting effect that I'll come back to later. Anyway, but the main thing is good gene detectors, very difficult to use if you really want to bind many different components together because the tuning in the, in the temperature range becomes really, really critical. Okay, so uh, we want to, to, to have this, this addressable complexity. We want to have structures that, 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 that have a large number of distinct building blocks that all should be in the right place. And, um, that is a bit like what we do when we do puzzles. I don't know whether you do jigsaw puzzles. I, I don't like them personally. But as I said, occasionally, in particular for talks, I do experiments at home. And so in this case, I did that too. So here I see a jigsaw puzzle. And the important thing, you can't see it very well, this jigsaw puzzle has a thousand pieces. Now that's important because later on we'll be talking about real structures that have a thousand distinct building blocks. Um, you see, I already don't look very happy. Um, it, things are not going to get any better because after many, many hours, you see, I've done something, I have all these pieces, and I have really no idea how to progress. And this is not even self-assembly. This is me struggling with the puzzle. So uh, it is, from, for me, it was absolutely clear that this is not the way to do puzzles. I mean, I, I thought, uh, OK, so now the, the, the royal we is, is inappropriate. I need puzzles that can self-assemble. And, uh, and so actually, and, and, and we want to go beyond what you can do with existing techniques. So this kind of puzzle, even I can do, that's not so interesting. We want th puzzles with a thousand pieces and they should self-assemble. Now, the interesting thing is, and, and for me at the time that this was published, which is now six years ago, was a real eye-opener, is that these things exist. And I'll show a picture. And I should stress that until now I've been talking about colloidal particles coated with DNA. Now I'll be talking about something that doesn't contain a colloid in a sense yet. It's just pure DNA fragments. But the ideas behind this technique can certainly be extended at some point to uh, things that actually carry a load. So it doesn't have to be pure DNA all the time. So this is not yet a colloidal example, but this is what we have now. Okay, so this is the picture that, that the Pete in 2012 is by the, the group of Peng Yin at Harvard. And uh, what they did is they made structures containing over a thousand distinct DNA fragments. And I'll show in a minute what these fragments look like. They have very specific binding and uh, they can form different structures. They are finite. In this case, later I'll briefly show extended structures, but these are finite structures. So here you see a block. Cube, not very exciting, but I mean, every particle in the cube has to be in the right place. 
And then you see that you can have a cube as a whole, you can have a, a numbers, you can have uh, letters. And what you see here typically is the, the design structure. Then you will see uh, what you get from a single electron micrograph. And this is what you get if you ma average many electron micrographs. So actually, all these different target structures have been uh, reproduced and, and actually have been observed to form in these experiments. So uh, roughly speaking, how does it work? Uh, the building blocks all go their own, to their own place. And so this original, this, this parent structure has the maximum number of building blocks, which is over a thousand. And then the only thing you do is that if you leave out of your mixture all the things that would be in the middle here, then for instance, you get this one. So you just create structures by leaving out components. And so this is how from the same set of building blocks, you can get this whole array of possible structures. And since then, I would say it had this, the number of distinct structures you can make in this way has, is, is large but finite. And since then, people have found tricks to actually extend the, the, the range even much more. So you can really make an incredible number of distinct structures. And the, the building block, again, schematically, is something like this. It is a, a DNA strand, 32 bases, with a flexible uh, sp uh, unit in the middle. And the 32 units are grouped in, in sequences of eight, and they, they are grouped in the sense that every eight bases bind to another neighbor. And so if you see here, uh, this is the schematic representation of what you have here, uh, eight, 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 and this one binds selectively to a, a, the complementary group on another neighbor, this come to the, this other neighbor. So every DNA brick, as they're called, can bind to four other neighbors. The sequences as such, are totally random. That was a bit of a surprise. Initially, the idea was, oh, you have to carefully design them so you don't get incorrect binding. It turns out that unless you go to very large structures, you don't have to worry about it. So the only thing is that as soon as you have chosen this one, this one is fixed. So you have for every bond, once one sequence is random, the, the other sequence is, is fixed. And then because you have four neighbors, you get a structure that looks a bit like a diamond lattice. But of course, the difference is, is in, in diamond, every lattice site is a carbon atom. Here, every lattice site is a different DNA brick. So that's quite amazing because now suddenly the, the, my jigsaw puzzle has been solved in 3D with more than a thousand pieces by self-assembly. So that's why I was very, very impressed. Uh, so again, the question is, how is this possible? And, and this, this is how is it possible that, that suddenly something that seemed to be totally impossible with colloids uh, can work in this case? And, and um, I, I think, but I, I mean, I just argue it and, 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 and hope to give some indirect evidence that the main reason is, uh, again, the same, th the same reason why there's a difference between a single thing binding to DNA strands and many, and that's that the transition is very broad. So here we have two units, two DNA bricks. They bind through a single DNA bond. And so, as you make the structure, this bond will be open, close, open, close. So actually, the stuff can anneal, and that, that annealing is, is absolutely crucial for getting the, the the right structure. I'll say at the end something else about maybe we don't always get the right structure, but people don't see it. But that's something else. So, the key thing is that DNA bricks have a very limited number of bonds per particle. In these early experiments, four. Um, I'll show experience simulations where we suggest that you can go beyond it, but it, it, it may be not so easy. Okay, simulations, and because for me, being computer simulators, if, if I want to understand something, I, I feel that I should be able to build a model that shows this, the phenomenology of the experiments, and then I can look in more detail at what's going on. So what you see here is not a thousand different DNA bricks, it's, it's 998, but okay, that's close enough. And what we did is we said, okay, we know that these particles built the four neighbors. So we made a very simple model where we actually took into account the fact that the particle has effectively four patches, like we, what we heard earlier this morning. And uh, so if you have then, the particle can bend to four neighbors. The, the, these, these green, well, you can see some, you see some green and blue things. Those are the complementary patches. And we give them the properties of real DNA. So we, that is, you take random DNA sequences, 
and then and then we 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 get from the the online databases dynamel so this is the, the, the it's something that implements the santa lucia rules on, online we compute what the binding free energy should be and this model therefore con contains the experimental binding free energies for all the for all the patches and then we just see what happens if you take this system uh, and and look at the self assembly this is our target structure it's a cube uh, but note, all particles are red, but in fact, all particles are different. So, but the, the thing is, how do you show 998 co different colors? There's actually smart ways of doing that, but here I just say, if all the particles are in the correct position within a cluster, they all have the same color. Okay, so now what happens if you take this model and start cooling down? And you find that if you cool it down to a first this temperature, 300 Kelvin, which is way below, below the temperature where things start to stick, you see different colors are all over the place. So this is what in, in crystallography you would call a polycrystalline sample. You go to a higher temperature and you see large domains of single colors, but still this is not what you want. You go up only two degrees and this is what you see. And at the end of this, this simulation run, you see that actually you have a cube that is overwhelmingly one color. So even in the simulations, and again, to our surprise, we found that these things, even though they're 998 different particles, they do form, form these, in this case, the this, this target structure. And, and in the, I've showed here before only one, but if you, if you add more particles, you can form several of them. And occasionally you can see the wrong particles on a cluster, but because it's dynamic, the things, the things only bind with one strand or possibly two, they attach the detach, they attach the detach, so this is not permanently stuck here, it, it, it attaches and detaches. Um, and not just cubes, so here you have other shapes that we find, just to show that again, you can actually make very much the same kind of structures that were seen in the experiments. The only thing where we had, a, well, the only thing we tried, and we in this case is Alex Reinhardt, where we tried and had a problem, it is kind of, 3D checkerboard with high and low, the, the, the white squares are high, the black squares are low. We couldn't make this in these simulations. It didn't form, it formed like only the base plate. But actually, that was a success because the experiments also couldn't make it. So, and sometimes, it doesn't mean that the model is right, but it, it means that it, is, it gets some of the physics right. Um, but of course, now you can do things in simulation that are very difficult in experiment because you can look at the early stages of nucleation and growth. And that, as Ben indicated, nucleation is a rare process and when it happens, it's a fast process. To actually zoom in on the moment when it happens is extremely difficult. But here, you see what happens if you start to, uh, to, to actually uh, evolve in time. And so what you see here is, now the, I should say, these are kinetic Monte Carlo simulations, so the time units are, but I say in strange units. How would you map it onto real units? Basically by looking at the, the mean square displacement of particle as a function of Monte Carlo time and map it on the real diffusion constant. Then you can tra translate this into seconds or milliseconds or whatever you want. Uh, the main thing is that if you work at a high temperature and you look at the size of the largest cluster that forms, that size is essentially close to zero or to close to one. No clusters form. If you go to low temperatures, not very low, 316, 317, Something grows very quickly and then it stops because of self-poisoning. Other clusters attach to the surface and you can't get your perfect structure. And then there's a very narrow temperature window, in this case between 318 and 319 Kelvin. This is actually fairly close to the experimental temperatures where you see that you have to wait for a while and then suddenly the, 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 the cluster starts to grow and you get the kind of thing you want. So uh, the fact that you have to wait for something to happen and this again, you could hear early in the afternoon, uh, strongly suggest that there's a nucleation process involved. Now, with simulations, you can do something that is really very difficult in experiment. That is, you can actually try to compute, to directly compute the, the barrier for nucleation. And so this is something that, that Alex did. And uh, you see here the free energy barrier. Here's the size of the clusters, the number of particles involved in the cluster. And you see that it goes up and it goes down, as you would expect for a barrier. But you see actually a bit more. Uh, we first thought, oh, the data are a bit noisy. This is not so great. And then Alex, who is extremely careful, got the error bars down and down. And so you see that actually, well, here you see symbols, but this is actually the error bars also. So you see this kind of zigzag pattern, and uh, the zigzags are real. So this is something that, that we, we would like to understand. Why do you get a zigzag nucleation barrier? Because for crystal nucleation, that is not what you, 
think. Well, I mean, in simulations, you never see that. Um, now, the, the, the reason why you get the zigzag is something that uh, another uh, person, uh, Dennis student, uh, Will Jacobs, sorted out. He actually used an even simpler way of representing the model and to look at the nucleation. And in particular, he looked at what happens near this position where you have a critical nucleus. Now, the, the thing with critical nuclei is that if you have a crystal, say, of, of, of all the same particles, then a critical nucleus of, of 20 particles or 10 particles, they, they're all the same. I mean, they're, they're basically, they're, they, you, you have to consider only one nucleus. If you have a thousand different building blocks, you have a large number of possible clusters that correspond to this structure. So we basically look at the total population of clusters of this size and look and translate that calculation to a free energy barrier. And uh, here you see, in this case, the Monte Carlo simulation for the barrier. Here you see this model that, that uh, Will Jacobs developed. And you basically see that although it's not quantitatively correct, it actually shows exactly the same features that we see in the simulations. So why is it zig? Well, the, the reason is that you have a diamond lattice. And so if you have a diamond lattice, you first have to form a two part, you bind two particles together. But actually, that is not stable. So that, a, a, a diamond tends to fall apart. Then you get a trimer, actually still not stable. You, yes, you gain some binding energy, but again, it's, it is exactly the same as what you gained in the previous bond, and it easily falls apart. One, two, three, four, five, that's okay. They all fall apart. Six, you make a loop. It is still not stable, but it is more stable than five. And so indeed you see one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you, see, you get another buckle. I didn't, for those of you who are into chemistry, it's the structure of adamantane. And so you, the next one is here, adamantane. So buckle by buckle, loop by loop, you form this kind of structure that actually then subsequently nucleates. Um, now, in the, in the experiments, uh, people chose, for instance, random interaction sets for this random sequence of DNA to get this nucleation process to work. But now that we can model it, in principle, we can optimize the, the whole process. We can say, oh, it's better to take all the interaction strength the same or all different. It turns out, so somewhat surprisingly, and I'll very briefly show it, that all the same is actually a bad idea. But you can really explore how you can best design these things in such a way that they form efficiently. Uh, the other thing that I want to explain, explain is the following. I said, this is, again, an example with a cluster. This is a smaller one. And here you see the free energy. And as I explained, you need to be in a regime where you have a nucleation barrier. If you go lower in temperature where there's no barrier, you get these amorphous aggregates that you don't want. So you need a barrier. But then if you go beyond the barrier, you see that the free energy minimum, so the most stable structure, is not the target cluster, which in this case is here. It is, it is down here. And you have to cool down and down and down. Actually, you have to cool down, in this case, all the way to 300 Kelvin before this structure becomes the more stable one, most stable one. Now we connect the theme of this, this, this uh, meeting again, and that is entropy. What is happening here is an entropic effect. And I, I explain this by showing uh, my puzzle again. Um, if I'm here in the puzzle, then there are many ways that you can grow the next bit. I'm, I'm not so good at it, but other people could probably find an, enough piece that would fit. If you're here, then basically, well, with the puzzle, it would be easy, but in, with assembly, there's one and only one position where you can attach another particle. So entropically, it's very difficult to complete your puzzle, and that's why the free energy goes up as you, you approach completion. And that's why you actually have to cool down to get the complete structure. Now, that is very unusual, because normally, when you predict something about crystal nucleation and growth, you say, oh, you have to be at this temperature to actually nucleate the crystal and then it's growth to completion. Here you, you actually say, at one temperature you have to nucleate and then you have to continue cooling, which actually is something that was done in these experiments. And you have to cool them way, all the way down until you can complete the structure and you get actually the target that you want. So that's uh, a simulation that suggests a protocol rather than a particular state where you do the experiments. Um, now, the other thing that, that I would like to, to check is, if, can we go beyond pure DNA? And uh, I think that the answer is yes. Uh, but uh, one thing is that, 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 that is important, I think, is in that case, that also to know whether you can go to different coordination numbers. Can you go beyond 4, 6, 8, or 12, or something like that? 
Initially, we were very skeptical because we thought that maybe you get back into the problem where the transitions become very sharp. It turns out that actually this is for 12 neighbors. So this is a non-existing structure, but in simulation you can do pretty much anything you like, as you, you may realize. You can make all these structures like the cube, the top hat, the thing with the hole, but notice that uh, occasionally you see point defects. And this is something that we find uh, in many of these simulations, certainly with a higher coordination number, point defects are a problem. And point defects are not showing up if you are reconstructing an image from many electron micrographs because it's averaged out. So I, I mean, it, I think it is a real issue if we ever want to make these structures to perform functions to get rid of point defects. But that's something that, that, uh, that we'll have to see in the future. Okay, so very briefly, you can also make extended patterns. So no, rather than this puzzle, you can make this puzzle and that extend forever. And I mean, there are again experimental realizations. And the only thing I wanted to show is, uh, oh, sorry, I don't know what happened here. I think something crashed that occasionally happens, but don't worry. I mean, I'll panic personally, so that's, uh, that's okay. It will come back. This is the wrong presentation. I'll close that one because I don't want that one. Sometimes the Mac opens all previous presentations you've ever shown in your life. Um, but I just have to find the correct picture. Sorry. Let's give it a minute to find it. No, no, it's, it just has to get there. Don't worry. Oh, was that what I did? I don't know. Oh, it could be. Anyway. Um, yeah, so, so basically, uh, we can also, in those cases, the way you have extended patterns and computer free energy barriers, they're very complicated, they have many intermediate minima, so it's not a simple barrier. I'm happy to discuss it after the talk, but not now. I want to say one thing about DNA origami, because which historically is older, where you make I mean, you've seen all these examples of people making smileys and boxes, etc., with, with a single long strand of DNA that you staple together. Actually, how these things fold, how these form, is also not well understood, but it's much harder to simulate. And so, uh, the, we, we, we've been looking at, at this, this the problem. You cannot do it atomistically. Even a coarse grain model such as OxyDNA is far too expensive to do more than, say, one or two simulations. So, if you really want to, map a parameter space, you need a coarse grain model. Alex Cumberworth, who was actually here, has worked on that, and I just show if it all works. A movie, for some reason, the movie always shows up as a loudspeaker, but it is a movie, I can assure you that. Um, if, if it is a clickable movie, it used to be. Yeah, there it is, okay. So this is an example of a, of a, a DNA sequence, that origami sequence that actually is connected by staples and the main thing is that this thing in this this short movie falls relatively rapidly uh whereas and so in, in actually in 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 a, in a matter of a, a few well maybe half an hour to an hour you can get structures like this to fold whereas at the time when the or the oxford group did the ox dna simulation it took six months of supercomputer time to do the same so if you want to do it systematically you have to do something like that now uh the last thing I want to tell is something about uh, multivalency, but multivalency outside of the regime of, uh, of making order structure. And so I say something about uh, the following thing. We, in, in a, we, we considered a longer time ago DNA coated with long colloids that can connect in any way you like. So I, I don't, I'm not very good at movies, and so typically this is my movie, what happens if you cool it down, all these things bind, there's long DNA, but of course you can see there's many possible ways in which this thing could bind. Now suppose that you have a system of such particles that can bind and form all these bonds, it is like a molecule that has in this case a tetravalent bond, rather than so normally you have double bonds, triple bonds, this is a fourfold bond, and you think, okay, this molecule must be inert because all the bonds are satisfied. And so, that's what we thought, and we did a simulation, and here you see the dimers, red, blue, all the bonds are satisfied. And then what we did not expect is that as we increased the density of the system, suddenly this happened. 
you get a very dense, very large density of a dense percolating network of these, of these, of these red and green particles. You think, why is that happening? Uh, because it cannot be due to the binding free energy because all bonds have already formed. This is in a low temperature regime. So why is there a transition? And the transition is because of entropy. And the, 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 to just give you a very simple idea, suppose that you have three, three possible bonds that are possible between here, three receptors, and so here, this can bind to that. But there's three factorial ways you can do this. And if you have six particles, there's, a, there's six factorial ways you can do this. And this becomes a huge effect. So the, the more ways you can reconnect, the stronger the effect becomes. And that's why these, these things re, re condense. And it's like a human example, it's more or less this kind of situation. How many ways you can actually reconnect the telephone exchange. I think they don't work like that anymore, but I'm not completely sure. Okay, right. So to conclude, possible biological implication, how do pathogens select their target? So here you see a, 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 a pathogen that has discovered a cell, and it binds to the cell by, because it has a receptor, a, a, a ligand, and on the cell there's a receptor. Uh, this is not a very smart pathogen, but it does pretty much what the pharmaceutical industry does. So that's it's pretty as, as smart as the pharmaceutical industry, but no smarter. Very strong bond grabs it and never lets go. Um, so that's what it says, actually, so it must be true. Um, extinct. That doesn't work. The reason why it doesn't work is that it grabs, because typically in cells, if certain ex receptors may be overexpressed, the, the juicy ones that this bacteria wants to eat, but other cells have the same receptors, and whenever it's stuck, it just has to eat whatever it gets. This one has many ligands, binding receptors, and everyone is weak. And this is the right strategy to use. And so this one, and basically it, it, does, it says, I only want cells that really have a large number of these receptors, and then, then that's the one that they, that they eat, and this one is the one that actually we have to fight every day. So uh, what is the reason why, why this happens? And this is what I said at the beginning. Multivalent binding is extremely sensitive, among other things, to the number of, of possible bonds. And so what you want also, if you're not a bacteria, but you're a drug company, if you want to target a, a cell that is diseased and that has many receptors that express the state of disease of the cell, and you don't want to have side effects by targeting the healthy cell, you want to be able to distinguish this from that. And multivalency does exactly this. So here you see an example how many particles, in this case it's drug delivery capsules, are bound as a function of the receptor density. If you bind only one, you, get, you have to go, you have to change the receptor density by a factor 100 to go from here to there. If you have only 10, not a huge number, you see that you can only change, by changing the, fact, the, the receptor density by a factor 3, you can distinguish. So you can really distinguish cells from, uh, that you want from cells you don't want. And this is actually a measure for the selectivity that I don't want to go into, but you can actually show that you can make the things really, really very sensitive to the receptor density. This is just a picture to illustrate what I just said in words. Here we have two surfaces uh, where there's receptors, the receptor density here is three times higher than there, and we have here particles that bind with only a single ligand, and here we have particles that bind weakly, but with 10 ligands. If you increase the concentration of receptors by a factor three, you see that here you don't even have three more, well, there's of course there's disk fluctuation, but you don't even have three times as many particles bound. If you re increase the receptor density here by a factor three, you see you have 10 times as many particles bound. So this is the way really you want to target surfaces with many receptors. You have to use multivalency, and you'll be pleased to know that no pharmaceutical industry does it. Okay, uh, so this is actually an experiment that was done in the, the, the group of Ralph Lister and uh, Galina Zubacheva, where they had a model system that was also multivalent, uh, building, binding to uh, ferrocene on gold. And, and effectively, what this, this picture shows, and you have to just take my word for it, is that you have uh, a clear signature that indicates that the, 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 the multivalency gives you a, a highly enhanced response to the receptor density. So there too, you, it's not just in a simulation, but also in the lab, be it in vitro and not in a living system, that could be, then we could demonstrate that these things really do work. Uh, the final thing I wanted to say about this is that um, if, you, if you want to target cells, very often uh, different cells have different receptor profiles 
but it may well be that any individual receptor concentration is not so sufficiently different between the target cell that, that you want to, to bind to and, and the healthy cell. But as a whole, the pattern tells you a, a lot about the state of health of the cell. So we were interested in ways in which you could actually use a nanoparticle that has multiple different receptor ligands binding to multiple different receptors. And so what you typically, again, would like to achieve is the following, that if you, if you want to target this cell with only, well, a mixture of receptors, and you don't want to target these two, how should you design your nanoparticle? What, what, what kind of ligands should you put on your na nanoparticles? And uh, the, the answer actually is, uh, is su surprisingly simple. You get generic answers that actually don't, don't require any much deep knowledge. Uh, the first thing is that, not surprisingly, if you know what your target receptor pro concentration profile is, the ligand concentrations on your nanoparticle should be the same. So if it's 3070, then the ligand concentration of that, is, that is cognate to this receptor should also be 3070. More surprising is that the binding free energy per ligand should be such that it's only bound 71.5% of the time. That doesn't depend at all on the chemistry or anything else, it's just 75, 1.5%. So it's not very strongly bound. It is not what the pharmaceutical industry does with their immune-based, so that they typically have these, um, these antigen, antibody binding things that are you never can pull apart in your lifetime. These things bind very weakly, but there are many of them, and this is the optimal percentage of time that they should bind for, to, to get a good result. Um, I, I find it very interesting. I hope that at some point people are going to use it, but at the moment not yet. So this is actually to show how this works in the practical case. Here we had two targets. Here we wanted to target a 50-50 mixture, and here we wanted to target a 30-70 mixture. And this picture just shows that indeed, it is not, it is not a, 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 a totally 100% sharp dis distinct point. You can see that here you bind much more strongly, or twice as strongly to the, the correct as to the incorrect, and here you have maybe even a threat of, threat of factor three or four. So you really can distinguish between these different uh, receptor profiles by designing the nanoparticles correctly. Okay, now I come with, I end with a homework question. And I, I, I always ask this question when I, I meet doctors. And the, and the question, the, 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 the question I ask is, why do we get a fever when we have an infection? And uh, I think that the answer is not known in the sense that I always get a different answer. And so that strongly suggests that the answer is not known. Now, uh, now you all know about multivalency. And so uh, I think that one possibility is that there's almost no process in biology that, I mean, of course, all processes in biology depend on temperature, but uh, they, 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 you need a, like a 10 degrees change to get like an order of magnitude change in the rate. Here, with fever, we talk about two degrees, maybe three, if you're really bad, if you're seriously ill. There are very few things that are that sensitive that, they, that, that this is an on-off switch. And so, but if you have something where you want to suppress multivalent binding, that might be just enough. Now, whether this is true or not, I don't know. And that is, therefore, the homework assignment for today. And with that, I would like to stop and uh, answer questions. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Don, for a fascinating talk. And uh, we have time for uh, questions. Yes. So in the uh, receptor uh, ligand binding, so here you are talking about the binding, but the cellular uptake, I mean, anything happened to happen, the uptake has to happen. Yeah. So how is that uptake related to this multivalence? Is there a correlation? Uh, binding yes. may not okay. be necessarily... So the, we, I mean, when I showed this result, I didn't show the result for uptake, but actually, um, uh, typically what... Uh, well, there's different ways in which virus particles... Uh, do their work, but one is actually by getting into the cell. So you, they have to trigger endocytosis. And again, there are different ways in which endocytosis can be triggered. Sometimes you make use of the active machinery of the cell, but sometimes you do it passively. So what we looked at is what, whether you could have passive endocytosis. And in fact, for the very example that I showed, which is this mixed 
uh, uh, ligand profile, we could show that actually if you have a matching composition that these particles get endocytosed into the cell. So, but, the, but I mean that there, there are so many different possibilities that we are a bit reluctant to, to attach too much attention to the fact, apart from that, that really we can get things into cells and we have models for a cell membrane that have reasonable values for the, <clears throat> for the bending constant. So we think it's, it, is, it is at least a not totally a hypothetical model. Oh yeah, wait, it's not yet working. And yeah, now it's working. Um, you talked about how uh, multivalent uh, binding provides entropy to the system. Yeah. Um, can it be tuned enough so that it competes with the uh, loss of entropy due to crystal formation and then destroy the nucleating barrier? Um, it, the, the thing is that, well, the answer, well, the, 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 the short answer is I don't know. Uh, the, the slightly longer answer is that if you want to make optimal use of multivalent binding, uh, it is very useful if indeed you can reach many different receptors on, on the, the target particle. Now, when we were looking at the problem, we were typically looking at particles that have only a relatively small number of DNA, and then they have to be pretty long, and as a consequence, they, they can also bind to particles that are next nearest neighbor, etc. And so then there is no specific advantage anymore for forming a crystal at all. However, if you were to look at the kind of densely covered colloids that, that Ben Rogers was mentioning, uh, there you could actually use multivalency and still be fairly local in your inter interaction. And then it might well be that, uh, that simply this entropy of binding in a multivalency case uh, is enough to, to uh, tip the balance towards crystallization. Yeah, so uh, this is a question about the zigzag free energy yeah. uh, that we see. Uh, is, this, is this generally true for uh, when you're nucleating a diamond lattice, or is this because of the specific interactions that you have in your system? No. And is this temperature I, I, dependent? I, that's, I mean, the, 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 so the, the, the zigzag pattern nucleation barrier is really something that you will get whenever the actual critical nucleus is relatively small, and it is for these things. So, Typically for crystals, your nucleation barriers may be 50 or 100 or more particles. Here the nucleation barriers were order 10 or 15. And at that level, you actually see the molecular structure. And so uh, the, the, in, the, in the case, well, I, I, I didn't show, maybe I can show uh, some other nucleation barriers for other coordination numbers where you see the effect is there, but it's less. Um, so it, then, then it really is, it has to do with the, I hope I have it. I think I do. Yeah. Um, so here you see that uh, this is for coordination numbers uh, uh, four. Wait, I have to be four, six, and twelve. And and you see that there are, there are still these 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 zigzags, but but they have a slightly different structure than than in the case of four. Uh, the other thing that you see is that in, for the higher coordination number, the barriers tend to be higher. And we thought that as a consequence, you would have to supercool more to actually get nucleation. And we were worried that then growth would be too fast and you would get lots of defects. And you get more defects, but apparently still you're able to roughly get the right structure. But these are things that have to be sorted out in much more detail. Uh. So, so given that you have specific interactions, does polycrystallinity play a role in the sort of barrier you'll see? Um, the, well, I mean, I mean, there's two things. First, uh, we have the specific interactions, but also non-complementary DNA strands can bind, be it more weakly. And so there is, a, in a sense, a, a sweet spot where the, the, the complementary DNA dominates the process and you don't, you don't yet run into the problem that all the non-complementary stands. If you go to low temperatures, which is what I showed when I get this, this very strongly polycrystalline sample, that is where, where actually your entire process is killed because you have too many non-specific interactions. Uh, you showed that the DNA is a very efficient tool to assemble structures. I'm wondering why nature doesn't use DNA for every assembly. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, I, 
there, there are, I mean, again, the short answer is, of course, I don't know. But um, I think that that um, also, in, 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 if you talk about technological applications, I don't think that in the future things will necessarily be based on DNA, because DNA, and certainly RNA, are not particularly stable materials. And so, um, if you want to have something that survives for a longer time, uh, then, then you, you, you probably want to use something that, that is spontaneously more stable. It, DNA basically has to be chaperoned, literally, first to fold correctly, and then there's all these DNA binding proteins that we heard about earlier that make sure that the DNA falls into a relatively robust structure where things don't fall apart. So I think that DNA is, in on its own, uh, something that, that doesn't live forever. And actually, people who move from physics to biophysics and start doing experiments with DNA always find to their horror that DNA is not like silicon and that after a few days or a few weeks, if you're not careful, what you thought was in your, in your test tube is no longer there. I think that that would be my answer, but that's a, a non-expert answer. But maybe Ben wants to say something about that. <laughs> So it seems to me that in thinking about the kinetics of assembly, that what you might want actually would be highly multivalent interactions that have a very sharp transition, but have a spectrum of individual interaction strengths. So that as you scan temperature, you could have a hierarchy of different parts of the structure assembling. And you could imagine varying the GC content in your DNA sequences as a way to... Absolutely. I, I, I just want to check if I, I have that picture, but may, may, otherwise I'll say it in words again. But um, uh, no, I think I don't. The, the thing is that if you want to make more complex structures than the ones I just mentioned, then what you want to do exactly is what, what you say. You want to use a hierarchical process. So you say, I first make a sub-building block by things that bind at a higher temperature. And then possibly what you do is you, you, you make that building block permanent by ligating the DNA so that actually it doesn't fall apart anymore, something like that. And then once you have done that, you actually bring those things together. And actually what we found is that it's not a good idea to just make things that would stick directly, but that you would need additional units, building blocks to stick, to act as a glue to bind, bind these things together. But then you, you can, at least that's what we found, that we could then make these extended 2D puzzles that, that I, I refer to. You re, it, it, the optimal way is to first make a sub-building block and then a, a separate unit that at a lower temperature sticks them together. I mean, you could imagine an algorithm that once you have your random DNA sequences, there's some variation in binding strength and the algorithm could place them uh, okay. met, you know, physics spatially so that the assembly would happen. I mean, that, that, that's, I mean, it's very good to ask the question because first of all, I, I hinted at the fact that the, the making them all the same strength was not a good idea. And the reason why it's not a good idea is that if all the binding strengths are the same, then any part of the structure could act as the critical nucleus. And so basically by the time it goes, everything goes. If you have a subset that binds more strongly, then that acts as a seed on which the rest can grow. So first of all, you want the binding strength to be not all the same. And, and I think that that, that that is one thing. The other thing is that you can indeed then design your interactions to, to give you an optimal pathway to self-assembly. And I think that that is something that at the moment is feasible, I would say. We haven't explored it, but I, I'm pretty sure that if you want to, to control the assembly of these things, that's exactly what you have to do. Hello. Yeah. Uh, in that multivalent, um, uh, uh, you know, interaction. Uh, so you have your cell, which, uh, which that cartoon that you yeah. did, which were those tentacles, and they will have to come and attach. The more they match, the greater is the probability of attachment. I was just wondering whether the shape. I mean, there is a particular distance. Uh, which they have to, minimum distance which they have to come together yes. to be able to attach each other. So do the shapes of the two have to be complementary or something? Um, the actually so that one of the, no, the, I mean, so the shape does matter. Of course, cell shapes fluctuate and bacterial shapes fluctuate to some extent, but less. Uh, 
but uh, it is certainly also true that in when people were thinking about multivariancy, because of many, there have many, many, many much done work on done on multivariancy, people said one of the reasons why uh, you have multivariancy in biology is precisely to adapt to the shapes of different uh, surfaces. So that that could determine what length of, of ligands you want to use so that you can effectively explore the surface. In one of the earlier talks, um, if one, I mean, so the, uh, so the time of attachment could be a stochastic process if there is, so if one gets attached first, it would put a constraint on the flexibility of the other ligands because it's, if it's attached really strong, then how will they adapt um, the two yeah. shapes to be able to, you know, get the maximum sort of efficiency or in binding is does is there anything like that in real life in science? i'm sure there is i mean but the, well, the, the first thing is that if you if you attach then the one thing you have already done is all the translational entropy you have sacrificed you have sacrificed yeah. so for the rest it's easier to bind from orientational the energy uh, on the other hand if you bind in a position where you can bind to one ligand and there happen to be no others available to bind to the other your there is no receptors around for the other ones then that's not going to be successful. So it, it depends also very much on the environment, whether or not uh, the first bond is, is the, the trigger for a real multivalent binding. Uh, yeah. Question. Uh, um, about this uh, um, point you made that in principle you can design the uh, uh, interaction energy to accommodate this optimal uh, uh, pathway. So this late stage when uh, it sort of slows down, you need to cool it down. Well, I, I would call it uh, IKEA effect. It's when you have this uh, uh, set, right? You, you want to build and, and then one piece is missing and you are, you're pretty much done for, for the day. Uh, so uh, in our study, the way we approach this, we would just uh, manipulate the concentration so it would have much more concentration of those on the periphery uh, but of course you need to make sure that the, the nucleation doesn't start there so in this way it should be consistent with interaction so you have clear nucleation center and then a little bit excess of things uh, which are farther away and this way you don't run into this absolutely so you, you but effectively concentration comes in the whole story as effective binding for energy. And so you might as well say if you increase the concentration of certain building blocks, or certainly if you have a DNA linker, if you increase the concentration of the linker, it is as if you make that interaction stronger. And so you, you can indeed play with that and maybe even say, oh, I only add things later in the process. I mean, there's, the, there's a whole lot game number of games you can play. Sure. No, I agree. I agree. I mean, there's more I could say, but I will not. <laughs> okay, I'm sure many of you have uh, questions, but I guess we have to uh, stop it at this point because there is something else after this. So let's thank Don again for a very interesting uh, talk. <laughs>